Okay. Right, McCarpy, um, where, where did we get to? Can you hear me? Time? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know what's happening. I think that every time... Uh, it keeps cutting out. McCarpy, just uh, while McCarpy is sorting it out, call out McCarpy as soon as you, you think you've got your voice again. I can hear you now. Yeah. Right. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay, hear you. Okay, okay. Grand control to Major Grand Control to Major Tom <laughs> Dar es Salaam coming in, McCarpy Salasi. Come on then, McCarpy, say it quick before you cut out. Okay, um, yes, this week um I wasn't uh I wasn't able to come last week. I was out in the country somewhere, driving along um, bumpy roads. If you remember that drive to um Natalie's parents when we were in Jamaica Lee's, it's like oh, yeah. that times yeah. ten. It right. was like that times 10, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I got really beat up um, on the drive. But anyway, um, I was able to speak to my niece um, in Jamaica. She's in St. Thomas. And she's my um, elder sister's daughter. Um, she was left behind, uh, left behind in uh, Jamaica. So um, her mother left her when she was a baby. She saw her mother once in her life for about three hours. Um, what she never, uh, she was brought up by her grandmother, and so she never knew like our side of the family at all. Um, she get a parcel. She can remember two parcels coming in her life. Um, telephone calls around about Christmas time. Um, if um, if my sister did write, it was to her, it was, did you get the money? Uh, she said she knew uh, the grandma, uh, mom, mama, or mother. Um, what else? She never, she never, this is, these are her words, she never felt a mother's love. Um, and she stated that COVID was the best thing that happened to her. Because it was during COVID that my nephew, uh, from my, my other sister, uh, got a telephone number because he, he was a left behinder. Um, but he came, he came over to England, uh, got a telephone number, uh, gave us a telephone number, the senior side of the family telephone number, and we got in contact with her. So she says that COVID was the best thing that happened in her life because she was through COVID. She was able to get in contact with us. And um, yeah, we still keep up communication. And um, she said another great thing in her life was she was able to speak to her grandmother and see her grandmother uh, by video. Uh. That's fantastic. You've great. disappeared again. Yes, you're coming back. Um, cool. Um, before my mum passed, job her own children. Yeah, yeah. McCarpy, I don't think we've got a very strong line this time. Maybe we need to record the rest of these stories that you've um, you've been researching okay. for us. Um, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry. So did you hear any of what I said? Or... I did. We heard your story and we got up to the point where you're... Um, uh, the niece was saying that COVID was the best thing because um, she was linked up with the family that, um, that that she'd lost, really, and that you're all in touch with her still. And she saw her grandmother. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's mainly it. Um, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. That's mainly... Yeah, well, McCarpy, thank you. Stay on the line and listen to what we're, we're, we're going to be doing next because we're going to be hearing from June Elizabeth, if June Elizabeth's there. She seems to have disappeared off the screen. Um, but uh, thank you so much for making okay. that, that research and, and we're hoping we're going to write all this up. Um, yeah, just definitely. We didn't get the chunk of funding we were hoping to get for this, but we're going to apply for some other funding. So um, it's important that we do record stories. And I know your story, it would be lovely for someone to interview you and to write your story. Yes, if someone could record it and then truncate it, because I tend to, I think I tend to wander with stories because I've got so much there. 
Well, I yeah. think this is it. It's um, it's it's a, a, a skill that some people have. That I, have I haven't got you know, it. I was no good at writing essays. <laughs> No, I, I can quite understand. So we'll, we'll take that. So June Elizabeth, you've appeared back then. So um, June Elizabeth, you, you're you going to tell us some of your story. <laughs> this is a great storytelling right. session. Okay. Now, my story, it, I'm making it short and then I can tell you another bit another time. But first That's of it. all, I just want to say my sur last surname, Gully, has got an E before the Y. I don't apologise. Yeah, the reason why I say that is because my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, he lived in Kingston, Jamaica, and he went to war at 16 to Egypt to fight for England. So when he came back, um, they offered him a bit of land or some money, but the land wasn't very good. He said a mongoose wouldn't run on it, right? So he he took the money and then he became an entrepreneur and had the only mattress company in the Caribbean. So why mm. I say that story, you know, like the Yellow Pages, what we have, the equivalent to the Yellow Pages, um, when people were looking for Jamaica Mattress Company, still a registered company in Kingston, he put an E in Gully, so it stood out. Oh, right. <laughs> so, wow. You know, when I see some people just write it without the E, but I always try to remind them to put the E in. That's it. Okay. Yeah. It, it reminds me of his, his journey. Yeah. So that's another journey. So what I will say, um, my parents, my dad came from Manchester, Jamaica, but he, he lived in Kingston and he left Kingston in 1954 on the same flight as my mum who lived in Kingston to come to England. So they went to New York, then they took a ship over and came off at Southampton. That was 1954. And by the next year, August the 6th, 1955, my mum had gone to Colchester. My dad went to Hull up north, but he came to Northampton because in Kingston, he had his own shoe factory and his own shoe shop. So his aunt said, you need to go to the capital of the shoe town, yes. which is Northampton. Hence, our football team is called the Cobblers, yes? So um, that's how come my dad came to Northampton. And less than a year, my mum came from Colchester and they got married. So they met on the journey. It's a love story, oh, right? Oh. And they were the first Jamaicans to marry in Northampton. Hence, I was the first Windrush girl of Jamaican parents to be born in Northampton. So I can remember going to school and I used to think, well, I'll cut it short, just me and my brother had the same colour skin as myself. So I can remember when I said my prayers at night, I always added an extra line. And that extra line was, oh, dear God, please let me be white in the morning. <laughs> right? And I've been asked, why did you do that? I said, well, can you imagine when you're like three, four, yeah, five, going to school and you called some names, you know, kids call you names, but they had this Robinson marmalade and they had some gollywogs on it. So that was a nickname. They always say gollywog, nignog, you know, so it was... I only had my brother that had my colour skin, yeah? And um, the, 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 the irony is my grandfather sent for my mum to come back to Jamaica. He didn't like how my dad was treating her. So my mum took, took us back to Jamaica. And um, I lived with my paternal grandmother, me and my brother, in, in Litchfield in Manchester. And my mum lived in Wakefield 
Now, near Trelawney, and, and she was a postmistress, but she took my sister, who was three, with her. So it's like a reversal. You know, <laughs> I went to Jamaica, and then I lived with my grandma. And so she, I, I would have lived with her all my life if she didn't pass away. But that 18 months has made me, shaped me to who I am today because I went to school in Jamaica and I tell you what when you go to school in Jamaica you, there's it's a different cat, kettle of fish than going to school in England right for a start nobody called me names <laughs> right and then I still took my winter boots with me I wouldn't leave my winter boots behind so at school in Jamaica, they wanted to see these winter boots. In those days, they were like Wellingtons with cotton wool in. Anyway, I moved the story to going to Sunday school in Jamaica. Yes, because everybody went to Sunday school. And I lived not just with my grandma, but with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. Because some of my aunts and uncles, they'd moved away, left their children with my grandma. So I kind of grew up with lots of people in the household. <laughs> and I, the first time my brother and myself went to Sunday school, we did not know what the children were saying. We honestly thought they were speaking another language. They stood up and they said, Genesis, Exodus, Lutivitus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They were naming the 39 and the 45 books of the Bible. That's like the ABC. But in England, we sang little songs like Jesus wants me for a sunbeam, a sunbeam. So, of course, we thought they were talking a different language until we, we, learned, we learned the books of the Bible. That's how they started their Sunday school. So that's very clever. It's very clever for their memory as well. And I went to school in Jamaica for 18 months. When I returned in 1965, so I went the year after Jamaica had their independence in 1963. Jamaica had their independence August the 6th, the same day that my mum and dad were married a few years before, right? And what I remember is when I did go to Kingston for two weeks, two of my uncles, they, they kind of near the same age, and they were dancing in front of each other, right? Another time I'll show you what they were doing, right? <laughs> and it was called the Bassinova, yeah? Oh, and they were doing this dance, you do the Bassinova. So I was kind of thrilled, right, to see my two uncles dancing like they, they were the film stars to me. And then there was a lady that used to help my grandma because she had 10 children, right? But they're all grown up. And I said to her, excuse me, could you tell me the time, please? And she looked at me. So I know that children are sensitive because I can remember that this to today. I was six years old and she said, big girl like you and you don't know how to read the time. I said, I'm, I said, I'm only six. <laughs> but that lady that helped my grandma in the house, right? She taught me to read the time when I was six. So I made sure my son could read the time before he was six, yeah? And so I came, to, came back from Jamaica and very strangely, coincidentally, the headmaster in Jamaica was Mr. Elliot. He was like, he looked like a white man, but he was like maybe a fair-skinned man, or what do they call a red man, right? Red. Oh, Even yeah. though he's very whitey looking. And then when I came to school in Northampton, the headmaster was Mr. Elliot as well. So I can always remember both, I left one school to another, but as soon as I got to the school, I was put in the B class because I'd just come from Jamaica. But by the end of the week, I was put in the A class. But i never forget the first day, the teacher was shouting at the children and I didn't know what was happening. I thought, gosh, this is crazy. And she was saying, will you be quiet? But she was shouting at them and they weren't taking any notice. And I thought I could compare the difference in school, the difference in behavior, 
you know, and I I knew some children that would would talk back to their mum, you know, where in Jamaica that didn't happen. You, you wouldn't talk back to even somebody who wasn't related to you if they were older. You had that kind of respect instilled in you. So in my school, there were four years and two classes. So only when you get to the, 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 the even class was the bright class. So when I got to the fourth year, I was in eight, class eight. Now, if you came into the, the, the room as a visitor or a teacher, you knew who was who because they put you in a way if you come first in the exam they kind of put you in a row that you you know the ones at the back are the ones that even though you're in an a class they're, they're the ones that are not so bright now the first 15 go to grammar school well i've never had my exam and been a double number yeah so i've always been like seven eight yes but when I saw the girl who come 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they went to grammar, but I, they didn't let me, even though I passed my 11 plus. So I not only, I, I didn't know it was um, institutional racism, but I knew it wasn't right. But my parents, they didn't really come and you know, fight for my rights because they were busy working. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, and so, but it done me good because I went to the, the the local school, so I didn't have to pay two bus fares to get to the grammar, mm -hmm. and um, I remained in the. This was a pr predominantly white school. There, so I remember I saw a black girl and I went up to her, and she was from Jamaica. Um, well, anyway, I became a a head girl of a predominantly white school, yes? So I left school when I was um, 16 and a half and I became a cadet nurse, a pre-nursing student. Then I became a student nurse. I've done my orthopedics and I've done my general at St. Thomas's. Then I came back home and I had had a dream and I told my dad. Anyway, I was Northamptonshire's first and only black police officer in 1978. Now that was the days of the sus laws. So that, that period in the police force was very short lived because I had my hair in an afro. But when I went on when I went on duty, I put my hair in, well, we didn't have black hairdressers. So I came to London to Ashire in Brixton and I had my hair in beads, oh. not beads, in um braids. The African lady done my hair in braids. So and when I came, when I came out of the police training school in Warwickshire, Brighton and Dunsmore, um, nobody's ever seen my hair in afro. And then one night, CID invited me to a do that. They had a CID New Hope in in Bedford. So when I went home and got ready, there was no way I could go out because my hair needed doing. So I just took it out. I had to wait till the end of the month to have my appointment in London. And they all said, all the police said, oh, Patty Boulay's turned into Shirley Basset, you know? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, fast forward the next day, out of uniform, out of plaits, out of the braids. Because even when I'm out of uniform, there's only one black person in North Ants that's got braids, so they could recognise me, yeah? Remember, I'm the only black police in Northampton Shire, yeah? And I was based in Wellingborough. But fast forward, I was with my late brother, and, you know, we always got stopped by the police, and he was assaulted, and I'm just making it very quick because it's a mm. long story, and... What I knew is that a taxi man called for help, right? Because um, when my brother said, well, why are you, why are you, you know, why are you doing this to me? And he said, I've got every right, sonny boy, because I'm a cop. And my brother said, yeah, so is my sister. So when I flashed in my worry card, he let go of my brother like he was fire, right? And then a taxi man came along 
and just, you know, seeing a black man with the police, he said, are you having problems, Gov? So the police got brave and he put his arm around my brother and my brother was six foot, like six. And he just lifted his hand and he said, he said, you're nicked. And my brother said, what for? He said, breach of the peace. So my brother just lifted his hand and said, I haven't done anything. But because of my brother's height, when he opened, lifted his arm and the police had him, his arm circling him, the police flew across the road onto the pavement. His watch fell off, his hat, everything went going. So the taxi man phoned the police. And next thing I knew, two more panda cars came with two police in each. So there's four police now. And they didn't ask anything. They just grabbed my brother and threw him in the back of the car. And they just went to slam the doors, even though his legs were hanging out the car. Oh. So I went and break the car, you know, brace the... And I looked at one of them, like how I'd say, look, look at you, Liz. And I'd say, hey, Liz. That's not how they taught us at the college, how to put somebody in the car. You've got to put their feet in. And I put my brother's foot in. I said, never mind, Eddie, I'm coming. And they speed off with my brother. But the guy, he recognised me with my afro because that's how I was in the police college. And he was so frightened. He said, he called me Julie <laughs> instead of Jude. So it's not funny, but I, I jumped in to the police that started the trouble. He was driving away and I got into his car, right? Because I'm a police. And I said to him, switch off your engine and go and lock my brother's car up because they teach you that you've got to secure people's property. And next to a man's house is car, right? So got to the station, hell broke loose. And they said, unless I write what they want me to write, I'm not getting any paper. Fast forward, I managed to get an envelope because in them days, we used to live closer as black people. And somebody saw my brother in the panda and they saw my sister. She came into the station. She didn't have any paper. I, she had an, a letter and I took the envelope and I told her to get my sergeant out of his village to come to the station. And I used that envelope and I wrote what was necessary. And when my side, training sergeant came, it was a friend of my dad's. I said to him, I need you to write your name, print your name, sign and date it. So that paper proved that they didn't give me paper at the time. Anyway, fast forward to two weeks later, the chief super called me in to write an official police statement, right, which I did write. And fast forward again, 10 months later, I've left the police now. I don't feel safe because my sergeant said to me, you ain't half brave, Snowy. That was my nickname, Snowy, right? Because if you're in the forces in them days, if you come from Scotland, you, I think you were Jock, Ireland, you were Paddy, and Wales, you were Taffy. If your surname was White, you was automatically called Chalky White. So we had a white policeman named White, so we couldn't have two Chalky Whites. So we all sat around the table, well... We can't have two chalky whites. So we sat in the discuss and they came up with Snow White. Then they said Snowy. So that's my that was my nickname. And it was nothing like some people say, well, that's not right. But in them days, it was OK. Right. Because I know who I am. When I joined the police force, I was already a double qualified nurse. I had confidence in myself. So 10 months later, I goes to court. And the, the magistrates asked me to swear in and would I like to refer to my, and then I'll close off this bit here, my, my, my 14 pages. Now, when I look, it's 10 to four on a Friday and my mother is crying because the, 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 the five policemen have come and told a bunch of porcupines plus the taxi man and two other ladies that coincidentally were looking out their window. So when I got in the court and when I saw my mum crying, I'm the only witness for my brother, right, against five policemen and three police witnesses. And I said a prayer and I went in the box. And then when they said I could re refer to my 14 pages, I looked at the magistrate and I said to him, your, your, your honour. So he thinks I have no sense. 
because he's not a judge, he's a magistrate. But I said, <laughs> Your Honor, right? I said, if I was to shoot you now, you see the two other people that have just woken up, because they were like, they must have said, wake us up when it's four o'clock, right? This is serious. I've got to get their attention. I said, if I was to shoot you now, in 10 years' time, would those two gentlemen need to come and read that I shot you? Well, you hold my 14 pages, because what happened to my brother wasn't 10 years, it was 10 months. I do not need to read it. But I can guarantee you the eight witnesses that came before me, the most they had was two pages. And they had to read it because it was written for them. So that's how I started it. And at the end, and then when I came out the box, I went back in and I said, I don't know if anybody's told you this, any other witness, but I'm willing to die for the truth, right? And then they found my brother not guilty on 11 charges and, and guilty on one. And I took that one to a Crown Court and freed my brother. I went back to London and nursed, and I brought my son back every month when I got paid, because I had a son now in London. And so he knew his family in Northampton. And the police came to me and they said that the chief constable says they cannot afford to have me outside the police force, not with my brain, <laughs> all right? Anyway, that's another story, because my sergeant said to me, he said, Snowy, he said, you ain't half brave. You know how many times I go in the box and I want to tell the truth, but I didn't. So I says to him, I says, in my life, I've traveled England and I go everywhere. And if I'm walking and somebody's running behind me, I don't need to turn around. I choose to mm -hmm. because I'm not going to go into a witness box and change somebody's life by telling lies. He said, all the perks that we get, um, you know, I think you're quite brave. And then my superintendent, he said to me, the chief constable has asked me, this is when I've left, they called me back and they said, has asked me anything I can do to let you take back your resignation, I will do it. And I said to him, is it not your heart that keeps you alive? Is it, do you not spend the majority of your lifetime at work? And he said yes to both questions. I said, well, if my heart is not in my work, I am a living dead and I do not wish to be a living dead. And he just shook his head, you see? So moving on, that was my little bit in the police force, right? I went back to nursing. And then um, what I did say is that growing up in Northampton, when we came back from Jamaica, I remember on a Saturday, everybody came to my mum's for Saturday soup. My mum was a, the local dressmaker and the ladies used to come to get their dresses made to go to the local blues, the local, and they can't be seen in the same dress the next week. So she was always sewing for people, you know? And the relationship that I had in Jamaica, right? I maintained that. That's why I said, next time I'll give you a pictorial. Yeah, I've got it on a stick. I can let you have a pictorial of everything I've said. And I, I would fly to Jamaica, save my money and go and play dominoes with my grandfather. My grandfather wrote me a letter in 1976 and I treasure it. I photocopied it, you know. I treasure that letter. When I was like um, 20, 18, 19, he wrote me a letter. And um, I feel I am fortunate because I knew my grandparents on both sides. And my mum had 10 brothers and sisters, nine brothers and sisters. She was one of 10 and I knew them all. And my dad came from a family of 11 and I knew them all. And we're still in contact with all my cousins and the aunts that are still alive and the uncles that are still alive. So I feel that I'm fortunate to have lived both sides of the pond, yes? And I maintain my roots. And I gave a black history presentation at a school on Zoom in lockdown, and they asked me certain questions. And going to all white school, obviously my, my, my best friend, she's white, yeah? 
And so what I did, I showed them a picture of us in our school uniform. And then I showed them a picture of us now. She's still my best friend. So I think that's a, a nice way to, to, to close. I, 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 I retired, semi-retired last year as a, no, no, five years ago, as a, as a health counsellor, which I did for psychodynamic counsellor for 20 years, when I returned to Northampton after my marriage broke down. But I, I kidnapped a man from Battersea. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and we've just done 27 years of marriage. And he wow. said to his friend, people get less for murder, but we've got a nice <laughs> little life, yeah? Oh, he's a Jamaican. He's a Jamaican that came here in 1955 when he was a teenager. So he's got the history, right? And one thing that he told me, because I was interviewed on a London radio station and they asked me to name a song that makes me feel uplifted. So I, I named the Three Little Birds. Don't worry about a thing. And some people might not know, Bob Marley got that from Matthew 6 when you know, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that even the birds are fed, you know, so you don't need to worry about anything. And then you said, what about when you were a child? So I said, I was at an all-white school, and the song that uplifted me was called To Be Young, Gifted and Black, yeah, black. right? And I saw Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. Rupert, and yeah. Bob Andy. And one day I was at a concert you know, about maybe 25, about 25 years ago, I still got the lovely um, program and Bob Han Andy was there and he was doing a lap of honour. And then I saw him on his own and I went up to him and I just had to make sure it was him. I said, cause he had an Afro those days and he had grey dreadlocks. So I said to him, um, Bob Andy, I said, can I shake your hand? I said, that record that you sang, I was in an all white school and it gave me the confidence. I said, can I sing it to you? And I said, to be young, gifted and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. To be young, gifted and black. Open your heart to what I mean. In this whole world, you know, there's a million girls and boys who are young, gifted and black, and that's a fact. All right. So I shook his hand and said that song gave me confidence in an all-white school, and I became a head girl of an all-white school, right? And then they asked me a song. What song would you use for um, the Winnerous generation? This is where I'm going to finish today. Anthem. So I thought, well, I think I need to ask my husband, who's 19 years older than me. Yeah, he's 84. Yeah, he, he, he has got more articulation. I'm a writer. I'm a published author. He edits my work. He went to a good school in Jamaica. Right. <laughs> anyway, we won't go on about that. But I asked him. And he, you know what he told me? You'll never walk alone. I said, but that's that's some um, Liverpool anthem. Yes. He said, oh no. He said, an African American had a number one with that in number in 1954. And his name was Roy Hamilton. Yeah. And then a, 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 a sailor brought it over to Liverpool. And then when Liverpool start for come up in the football, they use that song. And so I, I ended my interview by saying, and then my, my, one of my favorite songs, it was by Louis Armstrong, Oh, What a Wonderful, what a wonderful world. world. So I said, we, are, we were, and we're still a bit living in a global pandemic. Yeah? But we mustn't worry about anything. Yeah? Because... Um, everything will be all right when it when everything becomes when everything will be all right because um it'll be a wonderful world 
Yeah, I use all the few songs to make a closing to say mm. that, you know, after the pandemic, the global pandemic, we won't need to worry about anything and everything will be all right. One love. One love. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the choice of songs. Wow. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for for preparing that for us. That was that was just just quite quite amazing. Thank you so Brilliant. much. Um, you know, again, a, a such such a different story, but so inspirational, so inspirational. Um, and that time you spent in school in Jamaica, such an important time for you. Where were you in school in Jamaica? I was, I, I was at school in um, Malgali. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It was Not three far. miles. From, it was three miles from Lichfield, and there was no bus, no taxi, nobody give you a lift, and you cannot be late for school. <laughs> and five miles from Mandeville, the capital of Manchester, and five miles from where I went to school. Really. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we overlook Mylgali. There's a beauty, there's a hill there that it stands out. It's on the same level as Mandeville, the coolest place in Manchester, where we've got all the expats. So brought up in a multiracial, because we had um, English Canadians, um, Syrians all living, of course, in, Man in Mandeville. It's a beautiful, yeah, lots of oranges. <laughs> Thank you. Bunmi, you've got a point. I just wanted to say I could sit and listen to June Elizabeth all day long. <laughs> she is a gifted storyteller. You know, in the, trad in the kind of traditions I grew up with, oral storytelling, it's fascinating. Thank you. Thank I, you I, very I, much. I, 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 Thank you I very much. Now, my, I my, 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 my grandmother, my maternal grandmother where I lived, she had a, a dairy farm. Oh. So part of our, my job before I went to school was to milk the cows. <laughs> and, and then it went in a big silver churn and a lorry came every day and took all, to they all rolled the it down, put it in the churn. So coming back to England, I mean... <laughs> Some people think that the milk comes from a milk bottle. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, it's a real gift you have. And, <laughs> um, I can just imagine you visiting schools and just sharing these things with the young ones, so that because not everybody is into reading books, you know, and not everybody has the gifts to be able to keep an audience, you know, informed and entertained. It's edutainment. It's what, what you just did is edutainment, you know, even adding the songs and all of that. I really loved it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was truly wonderful, yeah. truly wonderful. Um, uh, um, but, you know, some of your stories obviously are, are anything but happy. Um, but to be able to articulate the story of that arrest of your brother and everything that happened and your reasoning for resigning from the police, just so, so traumatic for you and, and for your brother as well. Just, um, yeah, I sometimes don't have the words to, to talk about the, those, those traumas that I know that you lived through. David Gleave um, put a note in um, in the chat, if I can just say, um, following up on, on Jeff Palmer's, uh, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer's uh, talk. Um, and Jeff was um, put into an ESN class, educationally subnormal class, um, initially when he, he arrived in, in um, Britain. And uh, Bernard was... Um, David was saying that Bernard Coward's book, um, How West Indian How the West Indian Child Was Made Educationally Subnormal by the British School System, is a, a really, really important read. And um, a lot has been quite a bit more has been done about that and about challenges. Um, yeah, my friend, sorry, my friend Miranda. You've, you, you, I'm there. Okay. Yeah, would, she would. 
um, Marika. Mm. Yeah. She shared with us when she came to Northampton, she was on the stage, and she said when she came from, I don't know if it was Australia, when she came to England, she went to the East End as a teacher. And she was told, you know, she, you know, it's, it was, it was a, black, a lot of black children from the Caribbean. And she was told by the headmaster, just keep them happy, keep them, you know, they don't have to teach them anything. She shared how that part of the institutional system held back black children. Yes. And, and my name, June Elizabeth White, I have other stories, which I'm not going to go into now, which when I send off my application, I got the job. But then when I go and they realise June Elizabeth White, born in Northamptonshire in the 50s, is a black somebody, the story changed, you know what I mean? So I, I couldn't wait to get rid of the name White and get a, a name that wasn't common. Then I went and married a blooming Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad I got the name Gully now, right? Oh, now, my names, I've earned them all. So that's why I like the name as I've got them. June Elizabeth. I got Elizabeth from my grandmother, my paternal grandmother. So that's the story of my names. Well, from one Elizabeth to another, uh, June Elizabeth White Smith Gully, spelt with an E. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. That was just so entertaining and so interesting um, again. Um, and thank you for the whole of that. Now, Ina in a minute is going to talk with us, but I'm not sure who she's chatting to at the minute. No, Ina? can you hear me? Um, uh, Cord, Bernard, Bernard Cord's um, book, I'm yeah. a part of that generation. Right. Um, and I remember the when he first published the book, but I went to teacher's training college at that time. And it was a part of the curriculum when you taught um, intelligence, whether it's nurture or nature. Oh, yeah. And with, and I remember in college with about, there were nearly 200 of our students, the professor um, stood and talked about the um, IQ testing, the research in IQ testing, um, to show that blacks are not as intelligent as whites. And he was lecturing to us 200 students. There must have been about 10 blacks in the, in the group. And I remember the a Rasta Farine guy was at the back and it was a wooden floor and the chairs were those metal chairs. And well, do you understand when I say suck your teeth? Yeah. When he, yeah, and he pushed, well, I was sitting in way up in front of him, but you heard the chair being drawn on the ground, on the floor and pushed it over and made such a noise and he walked out of, of, out of class. And at the end of the class, I said to the rest, of, I got all the blacks um, that were in um, lecture with us. And I went to the lecturer and I said, um, I think you ought to repeat the lecture tomorrow because you are teaching 200 future student, um, teachers to go out. You've told them how blacks are not as intelligent as white. You did not explain about the research because the research was carried out in America and it was carried out with the black in the South and in the North. And what you did not emphasize was that the blacks in the North had a higher IQ than the blacks in the South. The blacks were uneducated. They were deprived of so, they had so, much, so many deprivation, not just education, socially, psychologically, but what happened to them when they moved North that were there. IQ testing is also, you can coach anyone into IQ testing. And Bernard Cord books came in because my husband, I've been married a few of the years by then. I remember my husband, when he went to school, one of his, um, one question was asked about what subjects did you do in Barbados? And he said Latin and the, t the teacher 
um, said, what Latin? Say something in Latin. And the poor little 12 year old said something in Latin and the teachers put him in a um, C grade. And his mother, who isn't used to the education system, had paid for schooling in Barbados and knew her son, but she didn't know what to do. And my husband had to work his way up into a stream. And when he chose a book, he was given a prize and he was given, he chose a book. The teacher said to him, why have you chosen that book? That book, you will never reach that standard of understanding that book. My husband is a chartered engineer who recommended so many people to become chartered engineer. And it's how you go through the system. This is why I said to um, Sir Jeff is you've got to, it's to understand racism is there and how you go through it. And how, yeah, because you cannot, it's accept that it's there and it's how you not manipulate yourself, you're entitled to that. And one person you said, June Elizabeth, that makes you feel so good about yourself. Mine was at 16 meeting Shirley Bassey and sitting there and looking at, knowing her story coming from Cardiff. Shirley Bassey is my hero, yeah? When I sat there, someone who I felt, yes, she's fairer than me, but she's, she was singing and she was only singing to me and she was only looking at me. I, can I conf make a confession? I stole the money to buy from my mother's handbag to get the ticket to go and see her. And I got the seat at the front. I could see the fillings in her teeth and Shirley just blew my mind and gave me so much confidence to go through because I knew what she went through. So yes, there are lots of stories there. Thank, thank you. But Bernard Cord's book um, highlighted the problems that that generation in, um, in the 60s, late 60s, 70s had and what was perpetuated in teachers college about IQ and uh, nature versus nurture, which is why my interest and my master's is in human development, because there's no such thing as IQ testing. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone has watched Seven, Seven Up, the series of Seven Up. Yeah. yeah. Just going to, to say to you, to you there, Ina, what I'm going to do now is wind up, stop the recording, but don't go away because, um, Celest, um, I was going to talk with you as well and, and there's, uh, there's other things. We can just carry on talking. Yeah. So I'm just going to wrap it up now and say formally, thank you very, very much indeed to June Elizabeth, um, White Smith Gully with an E. Um, thank you. June Elizabeth, we understand your story, your, your passion for your name and your passion for your campaigns and the things you've done. Thank you so much. Ina, a very, very big thank you to you. You've really contributed a great deal in this. Thank um, you. Please colleague... stop me whenever I'm talking. To... <laughs> all right, all right. Let's just wrap this up and we carry on. Thank you very much to my colleague, um, at Marcia, and I'm afraid I'm not good at being a co-chair. You know that, Marcia, I warned you. Oh, you have okay. to butt in, you have to butt in. Thank you for my yeah. carpy Selassie from joining us um, all the way from Tanzania. Um, I hope you've been able to listen in to a bit of this. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Bonmi had to leave a little earlier and uh, she was uh, uh, just saying how um, how much she'd enjoyed this, this session, truly enjoyed it. And David, I do hope you feel better. And, and to your wife as well, if you've had COVID too, I hope you feel better soon. So I'm just going to finish the recording, okay? And then we can carry on talking.